welcome to the Monday Dividend Cafe from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I actually spoke at an event uh, on the eastern part of Michigan here a couple hours ago and then uh, got back to Grand Rapids uh, where I am for a number of client meetings and speeches and events over the next couple of days. And we just uh, had the market close moments ago and I want to give you the normal Monday rundown. I was on a plane from Atlanta to Grand Rapids yesterday, Sunday. And so I was able to do a lot of things with uh, today's Dividend Cafe that I love doing over the weekend. I think you'll find there's a lot of info. I'm going to try to cover all of it here uh, in the podcast and video. One of the things I want to do just to talk about today's market action is uh, today is what we like to call in our investment committee a uh, a TBG day. And what I mean by that is it was just sort of a, uh, you you have these every now and then in 2022, uh, we had them all the time. Uh, but a lot of the things that are sort of aligned with what we do, were, were all up today and on the same day. And you know, you'll often have one of them in a given day, but today energy was up huge. It was the top performing sector um, up 2.75% on the day. Uh, financials were up nicely. Utilities and consumer staples, which are more dividend-oriented sectors, were up big. And then a lot of things that we tend to be less prone to, you know, big cap growth got hammered today. The NASDAQ was down over 1%. Uh, the worst performing sector was technology, um, which was down over 2%. So you're not going to see very many days where there's almost a 5% spread in one day between technology on the downside and energy on the upside. But when you do see it, it's very likely going to have been what we call a TBG day. Uh, the bond market didn't actually do a ton today, which is surprising in, in how a lot of the dividend sectors um, performed. Uh, the 10-year yield was down two basis points. So the bond market was up, but not a ton. Um, and that yield on the 10 year closed to 4.23. It had started at four and a quarter. Uh, so, just interesting. I think this was the, the third day that, for example, um, NVIDIA was down. Um, and, you know, crypto, uh, this has been going on for about a week now, but uh, Bitcoin is down over $7,000 over the last week. Uh, about half of that was today alone. And it's now down just a tad shy of 20%. From its all-time high, which which was a full three months ago, it hasn't made a new high all the way since March. Even when a lot of this other Mag Seven and and uh, big cap tech and Nasdaq and other things have been making new high after new high, uh, it wasn't. So it feels to me like there's certain things happening in that uh, lower quality risk side of the market. Uh, but again, um, today was just kind of one of those days. Uh, now, you know, I've said a lot lately about the breadth of the market and the top heaviness, but, you know, candidly, 72% of the names in the S&P 500 are above their 200-day moving average. So it isn't that bad. I mean, that's actually pretty good. The, the point of top heaviness is not so much about a lack of breadth from other names doing well, because a lot of things have been doing well. It's just the spread between how well those things at the top of the food chain have done and, and where the middle ground lies. And, and not only uh, do we consider that to be unsustainable, but ultimately problematic for indexers. Um, for those who, who didn't get a chance to check out Dividend Cafe on Friday, where I dedicated it uh, to the subject of artificial intelligence and laid out sort of 10 principles or precepts that represent our point of view about investing in AI. Um, one of the things, I first of all, I would encourage you to read the Dividend Cafe or listen uh, to the video or podcast that was done on Friday. It seems to uh, be one that's getting a lot of feedback, and we very much appreciate that. And there may be some elements there that will be useful to your understanding about this AI investment moment. But one of the things I said in there was an analogy to make the point that right now all the AI investing opportunity has come in what I would call the backbone of AI and the analogy I used, and I made it up kind of as I was writing on Friday, was that if AI were food, all the money is being made by the companies that make ovens. 
but the actual companies that deliver food, you know, are in that actual food uh, uh, fulfillment business, uh, a restaurant, that, that they're not really part of the AI story yet. And so I thought it was a clever analogy. And then it just so happens on Sunday night, uh, scrolling through a couple little real things on Instagram, and uh, one of the more well-known VC uh, tech type investors uh, and uh, Chamath, uh, his last name, I'm going to get it all wrong if I say it, but if you rec if you saw him, you'd probably recognize him and, and he's the real deal. But he used an analogy that I liked even better, but it was pretty close to mine. So on one hand, I felt kind of smart, but on the other hand, I do think his analogy is even better, was that um, when refrigerators came out, naturally refrigerators, refrigeration companies, appliance makers, they made great money but who really made a lot of money was Coca-Cola. And in other words, you know, there, there are other products out there that are going to benefit from the product being used. You could argue, and I'm sort of making this up right now as well, uh, Facebook existed as a desktop application before there was an iPhone. But does anyone think Facebook would be Facebook if it wasn't for the iPhone? And so that's the thing I would say is that there are companies that are coming that we don't know what they are right now, who they are right now. There will be users of AI that will be um, a much more interesting story than merely just the backbone. But right now, the backbone's all there is. That's where the bid has come. And uh, it, it uh, in my opinion, is has bubbled uh, substantially. Um, I'm going to try to move this along a little bit. There's so much to go through. Uh, I found this quote from LucidWorks, a survey they did of 2,500 business leaders. Um, I don't have my readers, so I'm, forgive me. I want to get this right. Uh, 2,500 business leaders involved in AI decision-making to uncover the 2024 reality of generative AI adoption. Um, while enthusiasm remains high, the study reveals a notable slowdown in spending, with only 63% of companies planning to increase AI investments in the next 12 months. Well, 63% of companies saying they're going to increase AI spending is a lot, but a year ago, the number was 93%. And the slowdown is driven by growing concerns around cost of implementation, data security, and also just the accuracy of AI-generated outputs. Now, that's one survey, one company. 2,500 is a pretty representative number, but I was grateful uh, that Peter Bukvar, a friend of mine and economist um, who puts out a daily subscription research product that I uh, subscribe to, uh, this was something that was in his uh, daily report today. I, I was grateful he included it because I, th I, I actually think that my whole focus has been on valuation, not fundamentals thus far. And God help the, the, that place if the valuation and fundamentals weaken at the same time. Okay, um, I've already given you the movement of the day in sectors in the bond market um, and Bitcoin and market breadth. Public policy, um, I do have a white paper coming that's going to go deeper into all the, the ramifications in markets and economy of the political fall environment, obviously culminating in the November election, uh, heavy focus on presidential because that's where all the excitement is, but then looking at the Senate and the House as well. Um, there's a big debate this Thursday night. It's not just that it's the earliest you've ever had a presidential debate. I mean, neither party's even had its convention yet, but it's the earliest by three months. So you're going to have a more extended presidential cycle. I continue to believe that... Um, there's obviously some certain clear momentum and, and trajectory and regularity in certain polls, but nevertheless, everything being close enough uh, in the electoral college context that I think it's going to be very difficult to call and will stay that way all the way through the election. But I have said for some time uh, that Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and then in the Rust Belt, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, these six states represent where the election will go. I stand by that. Uh, former President Trump has held a, a consistent lead in Arizona, Georgia, and Nevada. Um, he's up in at least two of the other three states as well in the polling, but it's very, very tight. And if President Biden were to win Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, and President Trump would win the other three, and then the one 
congressional district vote around Omaha in the state of Nebraska, because they are one of the only two states that uh, portion by congressional district, their electoral college, then you would end up at 270 to 268 in favor of President Biden. If that one congressional district in Nebraska were to go to President Trump, you would be at a 269, 269 tie. Um, and again, maybe uh, President Biden wins other states. He's currently losing in the polls. Uh, maybe Pre President Trump is, is going to run away. You know, if Minnesota and Virginia and New Hampshire are really at play, um, you know, I, we'll, we'll see. It could very well be uh, uh, not as close in the Electoral College as some may expect. But my, my best bet right now is that it will be, and, and we'll keep an eye on that. Um, I am paying a lot of money uh, for institutional research and political commentary and analytics right now in this fall that very much form kind of how I am viewing things in the political realm and how it plays into some of the macro perspective, sector uh, perspective that we have in our investment process. And I think public polling is is great and fine, and, and especially when you're looking at the averages of polling. But there are a couple resources I've taken on over the years and developed a relationship with that I consider indispensable to my process. And I'll try to share as much of those, uh, the takeaways from that that I think are useful to you as possible in the months ahead as it pertains. It's all highly objective, not just from these resources. Um, they would not be good if they were not objective. But even my presentation here is objective. First of all, anyone who actually knows me knows that this is hardly an election I'm super excited about. Okay. Second of all, um, the, my interest in this with Divin Cafe is purely markets and economic oriented. So everybody has other sources of political news they can go to. Dividend Cafe is not going to become a place of political commentary, but I want good political information that feeds what I'm doing by way of economic commentary. And that's what you'll get from me going forward. Um, okay, uh, wholesale used car prices are now at their lowest level since March of 2021. They're down 24% from the peak. Um, that's one element of very significant deflation that followed what was quite significant inflation that I have always used as a case to make my point that this was such an intensely supply oriented bout of inflation, uh, existed home sale, existing home sales. The numbers came out on Friday. They were down 0.7% in May. They're down 2.8% from a year ago. That's volume of sales of existing homes. Um, on a national basis, the median home price is up uh, 5% year over year. I don't think there's such thing as a national median home price, but when you do all the math and that's what it spits out, it's somewhat practically insignificant, but nevertheless, data is data. 34% chance right now of a Fed cut in September. I think that will continue to go lower. I maintain my view that the Fed will cut 50 basis points this year out of the Fed funds rate, whether that's uh, one quarter point in November with another quarter point in December or half a point all in December, one way or the other, I still believe you'll see half a point cut out of Fed funds by end of the year, but I don't believe they will start that in September. Some disagree with me. Right now, there's a 78% chance of a cut by November and a 95% chance of a cut by December, and that's in the futures market. Oil up uh, big, the, the uh, midstream uh, sector had a major conference last week, very positive things being reported on balance sheets, on leverage, on dividend growth intentions, um, very, very interesting environment. And then the against doomsdayism and Ask TBG uh, special stuff, you'll have to go to dividendcafe.com to read it because I'm running out of time for the recording. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, I love our Monday edition, Dividend Cafe. I hope you do too. Thanks for reading. Thank you for watching. And thank you for listening to Dividend Cafe. Mm -hmm.